contains lots of information. We have the possibility, therefore, of using that radiation in some way or other by measuring it to determine all sorts of quantities. So Des and I began to say, how could we measure remotely atmospheric temperature from space? And the, and the basic idea of that was in Louis Kaplan's paper. And so that's what we began to do. And there is a, a picture of the spectrum uh, uh, taken from a, a satellite vehicle in uh, Nimbus 4 in 1970, uh, Michelson deformator, and you will know this if you know anything about the infrared spe spectrum from space. Um, here are black body curves, uh, that's at 7 degrees Celsius, this is at minus 53 degrees Celsius. The radiation from the surface, this is over the Mediterranean region in the window, this is the part of the spectrum where there's very little absorption. You can see radiation there coming from a temperature of a plus, plus, plus 10 Celsius or so. And so it's measuring the temperature of the surface. By measuring that, that amount of radiation, you can determine the, surface of the, temp the temperature of the surface. If you, here is the big carbon dioxide band. The carbon dioxide molecule vibrates, <coughs> vibrates strongly at around 15 microns in the infrared. And it's a very important band there, which, which does this. And in the middle of the band, where the absorption is very strong, the radiation actually comes from very high, high in the atmosphere, in the stratosphere. And, the, and you'll then, make, if you measure at that wavelength, the amount of radiation, then you um, measure the temperature of the stratosphere. So, and here is the edge, the, the edge of the band here. And you can see if you can actually choose frequencies within this range, or choose wavelengths here, you could actually make measurements of temperature at different heights in the atmosphere. The problem is that you've got to measure enough energy from your very tiny instrument, which can only use a very little bit of power. <coughs> and the detectors of radiation and that wavelength were not very good in those days, unless you could cool them, and we couldn't do that very easily in space. How could we get enough energy <coughs> to actually get the, this temperature structure um, remotely from this satellite going right over, right around the Earth's surface. So that was the challenge that, that we had. And um, the way we chose to do it, which was uh, a, a clever idea, it wasn't, a very, it wasn't an entirely new idea, but it was very appropriate to what, <coughs> to observing the atmosphere, <coughs> was to use selective chopping. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Would it be possible to have a glass of water here? I think I might need one in a little bit. Thank you very much. Um, you see, we can use carbon dioxide, take carbon dioxide, and put it into the instrument. And I won't explain exactly how it's done, but you have a, a radiation going to the detector through a path of carbon dioxide, and the radiation going to the detector without the carbon dioxide there. You, you oscillate between the two, selective chopping, and you can select the part of the spectrum you're looking at and also select from all parts of the band where that spectrum actually fits the amount of carbon dioxide you've got in your box. And that enables you to get enough energy to measure it. And so we were able to measure uh, temperature from space. And with, we worked with NASA, and the Nimbus, this is the Nimbus 4 satellite launched in 1970. That's about, uh, six, uh, about uh, two metres across from the top of the yeah, solar cells to the bottom. And it's a, it was a wonderfully advanced satellite in those days. And we had one of, the, one of those instruments down there is ours. And we were able to look at, the, uh, look at the Earth from space. And Jim Williamson's here. He was one of, the, one of the other people working with me on that. It's very nice to have you here, Jim. And, um, and we had great fun together working with NASA on, on this thing. And um, there's the launch in 1970. And that's some of one of our first measurements. That's the temperature at a height of about 40 kilometers. This has never been seen before on this sort of scale. And that's got stratospheric warming. This is a big planetary wave moving around the polar region, north polar region. The temperature there is about 10 Celsius. The temperature, not the other side of the pole, is minus 50. 60 degrees Celsius temperature difference across the two, you have this enormous planetary wave moving around the, uh, the pole. 
uh, and we were able to observe things of that kind. And um, we could also, because of a later instrument we put on called the pressure modulator radiometer, we were able to measure temperature right up to about 90 kilometers. And there's the cross-section of Earth's temperature averaged over a day, taken from Nimbus 5 and Nimbus 6, the selective chopper and the pressure modulator radiometers. And um, there is the, the temperature structure of the whole atmosphere taken from space at that time. And that was completely revolutionary in a way because we had measurements from the whole atmosphere right up to the, from the bottom to the top and um, we were able to uh, make good use of those measurements. Now, um, of course, the, uh, the measurements of the lower atmosphere had to be useful have to be very accurate. Thank you very much indeed. That's very kind. And um, the remote sounding of temperature from space is routine now in all meteorological services around the world. This is the UK Meteorological Office getting its data in. That's 33,000 sound, separate soundings of temperature taken with a, this is marginally now with microwave radiometers rather than infrared ones. But uh, for a long time it was just infrared ones. Now we have microwave ones doing it. And this is retrieving the temperature structure across the whole world from space every day, uh, two, well, twice a day from a polar orbiter. And that has revolutionized forecasting because we can now put accurate measurements of temperature and other things, water vapor and so on, a cloud amount and all the structure of the atmosphere from space on a global basis the whole time and the whole of meteorology and weather forecasting has changed enormously. And satellites, of course, have, have, uh, have continued to develop and to grow. i just show you that picture. That's Envisat. It's a European Space Agency satellite launched in 2002. It's very large and very heavy. It weighs eight tons. And it is full of instruments. I haven't time to tell you all about them, but it's a very exciting payload. And um, these, this is the payload. And, of course, you have acronyms for all of these things. Um, it has instruments measuring radiation from below. Those are the passive instruments. The radiation right across the whole, much of the spectrum are listed on the left. And then you also have active instruments. These are instruments where, you, where you're sending signals out from down from the satellite and radar systems, and you're getting signals back which tell you things uh, about, the, uh, about the Earth from, from, from space. I'll just mention one or two of these instruments. The uh, advanced uh, tracking, the long track scanning radiometer, which came from the Rutherford Laboratory when I was there as director, actually, and Jim Williams had a fair part to play in that too. And, we, um, and that tracks for sea, very accurate measurements of sea surface temperature by correcting for the atmospheric absorption by scanning along the track. Um, the next one is, is a uh, is a uh, passive atmospheric sounder in the infrared, Michelson interferometer, that is measuring right across the spectrum in the infrared and getting lots of data about not just, not just temperature and water vapor, but about lots of other molecules as well. The microwave radiometer, that's the microwave one, that's an infrared passive sounder, there's a microwave remote sounder, that's measuring temperature and water vapor uh, of the kind that I've just talked about before. On the active side, you've got a radar altimeter. This is um, measuring the exact distance between the satellite and the reflecting part of the Earth's surface. So you can measure the exact height of the sea surface and its topography, and that tells you about the distribution of ocean circulation. It also tells you about the amount of ice you've got on the ice caps, because you can measure the total volume of the ice below the satellite, because you can get signals back from it. And there's an advance. Um, synthetic aperture radar that is taking pictures, radar pictures uh, in the radio region of course, in the microwave region again it's, uh, it's, uh, and it's, it's very useful for getting structures the structure of the oceans you can get winds over the oceans because you can see how much scattering you've got from the oceans and things like that from a, an instrument of that kind and so I could go on but let me, I'm trying to give you a big picture today so I have to move on fairly rapidly let me now turn to computer modeling. Um, it's revolutionized weather forecasting. 
I remember in the 